Good morning. It's Monday, March the 22nd, and this is The Drill. (laughs) The Daily Declaration for Spiritual Warfare. You will bruise Satan under your feet. My child, do not fear Satan and his demonic angels, for I have already cursed him and stripped him of all his power for his deception in the garden. I have given to you the victory over all his impotent attacks against you. If you fully obey me and carefully follow all my commands, I will set you high above all nations on earth, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. I will open the heavens, the storehouse of my bounty, to send rain on your land in season and to bless all of the work of your hands. Prayer Declaration Lord, remove Satan's seat from my region, city, and nation. The Son of Righteousness has arisen with healing in his wings and in his power. I will trample the wicked and they shall be ashes under the soles of my feet. You have enlarged my path under me, so my feet will not slip. My enemies have fallen under my feet. And that was the uh, Daily Declaration for Spiritual Warfare for March 22nd. Okay, so I'm reading uh, one of George Lakoff's books, and it's the uh, book um, Don't Think of an Elephant, and about framing and whatnot. And he's talking about, he says, uh, he, um, it's a chapter 16, How to Respond to Conservatives. And he said the earlier chapters are meant to explain what framing is and how it works through language and communication systems what conservative and progressive worldviews are, what biconceptualism is, and what the deep issues are in framing. But sooner or later, you're on the front line called the dinner tables. My students regularly ask, Thanksgiving is coming, and I'm going to be eating dinner with my conservative relatives, and I'm going to get into a row over politics with my grandfather or my aunt. It's always painful. What can I do? So he responds with a letter that he received. said, uh, quote, I listened to Dr. Lakoff last Friday, Uh, night on now with great interest. I love the use of words and have been consistently puzzled at how the far right has co-opted so many definitions. Uh, So I tried an experiment I wanted to tell you about. I took several examples from the interview, particularly trial versus public protection lawyer and gay marriage and used those examples all week on AOL's political chat room. Every time someone would scream about John Edwards being a trial lawyer, I'd respond with public protection lawyer and how they are the last defense against negligent corporations and are professional and that the opposite of a public protection lawyer is a corporate lawyer who typically makes four to $500 per hour and we pay that higher prices for goods and services. Every time someone started screaming about gay marriage, I'd ask them if they wanted the federal government to tell them who they could marry. I'd go on to explain when challenged that once government has crossed the huge barrier into telling one group of people who they could not marry, it's only a small step to telling other groups and a smaller yet step to telling people who they had to marry. I also asked for definitions. Every time someone would holler dirty liberal, I'd request their definition of liberal. Uh, the last was my own hot button. Every time somebody would scream abortion, baby killer, etc., I'd suggest that if they are anti-abortion, then by all means they should not have one. Uh, i got to tell you the results are startling. I had some other people join me and take up the same tax. By last night, the chat room was civil. An amazing number of posters turned off their capitalization and were actually having conversations. I'm going to keep this up, but I really wanted you to know that uh, I heard Dr. Lackoff appreciate his work, and I'm trying to put this into practice, and it's really fun. And so uh, he says that the book is written for people like um, Penny Kolb. So, um, uh, and, I, and I just love this. I mean, he, he, gets, he gets everything backwards. Progressives are constantly put in positions where they're expected to respond to conservative arguments, and it's actually the opposite is true because conservatives or progressives, uh, the left is uh, creating movements. 
Conservatives don't need to create movements, uh, and we don't do that. So anyways, uh, but what's happening today, because this book was written back in 2014 uh, or thereabouts, and uh, before uh, all of the th nasty things that were been going on in uh, the past year. Now the opposite seems to be they don't want civil conversation. The left wants to put as sharp an edge on things as they possibly can. An example of that was uh, on Twitter. I uh, read a, a tweet by Senator uh, Warren who said uh, something was racist. And so every time they can make turn, the left can turn every, everything into, into something racist and use the word racist, then uh, they do. And again, every argument has to be sharp and it has to, uh, they have to bark at people and uh, so it's quite the opposite of what Dr. Lakoff is uh, expressing in his book. Now, um, I thought for a second, well, why is it that they're doing this, especially Senator Warren? Why would she do that? She has to work with people supposedly across the aisle, the Republicans. Are they, these Republicans now her enemy? Are they all racist? And if they are, on what basis is she going to work with them to get things like, say, the budget done? Or is this just going to be um, where, uh, well, anyway, so how, how does she do that? I don't know. And then it occurred to me that what she was doing here was an expression not of power, but of fear. That, um, she, that everything that's going on on the left these days is not geared to the right. BLM, uh, council culture, it's not geared to the right at all. It's geared to the left. <coughs> Excuse me. That, um, for instance, uh, um, you look again at um, Ellen DeGeneres, who was come, came under fire for being a bad boss. Um, and uh, all of a sudden, six, six months after basically saying, blowing off people who told her that she shouldn't be seen, with a Republican president. She was sitting in a, in a box at a football game with a Republican president, and she told them people, she said, hey, I'll choose who, who my friends are. It's none of your business. Six months later, she's in hot water. And I believe that everybody on the left is scared to death. The cancel culture particularly applies to them. What you have with um, uh, the Governor Newsom and Governor the governor of New York, is cancel culture. They're being canceled. Why? Because they had the temerity to say something nice, pay a compliment to Donald Trump. Both of them did it. It stunned me at the time. I thought, wow, uh, I'm not, you know, because of uh, four years of just constant uh, harassment, I mean, and worse. I mean, there's just no words to describe what uh, the Trump administration was uh, subjected to. But, um, the uh, these two lefties are now um, on the verge of losing their jobs and may well end up losing their jobs and their careers and all because they dared to pay a compliment to the President of the United States. And so the same thing with BLM. BLM is no threat to conservatives. It's a threat to liberals. It's a threat to blacks, not a threat to whites. Uh, the people who are scared to death of BLM are people like um, Oprah Winfrey and LeBron James because they know if they don't tow the party line, the BLM party line, all the way, uh, you know, the, uh, every day, all the time, that the next time that there's a, a BLM riot, it may be at their house. And there's no way they, they want that to happen. There's no way, especially LeBron James. He's got a family, wife, kids that he has to think about, right? So there's no way he wants uh, them uh, coming to his house and uh, doing the th breaking windows and whatnot. Uh-uh, he's not going to have that and, because he's in an untenable position. Call the police. Now he's in really trouble with the, the, the black community, as it were. So again, mo most of the... What the left is doing these days is to um, create solidarity with the left. And the people that are really scared and should be really scared 
is the left. Um, another place where the rubber hits the road, where you can see the influence, cultural influence of the left, is, again, the, the life, left ha hates binary conversations. They don't want to get into arguments about right, wrong, good, bad, and that's ultimately the way to defeat the left, is steer the argument into a binary argument, and then they're lost. They're screwed. Okay, so they're absolutely terrified. They're terrified of that the way the Wicked Witch of the West was terrified of water. Okay. Um, because if they get into a binary argument, they're found to be wrong, evil, bad, stupid, whatever it is, then it hurts their movement and, and I mean cripples their movement, maybe even destroys it. So they, they're desperate to avoid that. Now, how do they do that? If they hear people saying things that they know are wrong, they can't come out and say, well, that's wrong because now they're involved in a binary argument. So what do they do? What I've heard people do, um, a relative of mine that uh, used to do it, and I had a coworker that's done it to me once before, and you need to listen for this when you're talking to your neighbors and your friends and whatnot, is the, oh, I thought it was fill in the, fill in the blank. For instance, I said, uh, said something about, I don't remember um, what it was, and this coworker said, oh, I thought it was like this. And so what she was doing was correcting me uh, without coming out and saying you're wrong. Okay, so when you hear somebody do that, you need to say, no, you're wrong. Okay, and the point of this isn't to be right. Don't stop and think, well, am I right? No, it doesn't matter. The point is, let's have the argument. Let's have the discussion. Okay, uh, if you disagree with me, then you need to say so. Ron, you're wrong. This is the way it really is. So um, my uh, sister uh, did, that, did that to me the same, same way. I, we were talking about some childhood memory, uh, that, uh, and I described it in a certain way, and she says, oh, I thought it went a different way. And I said, no, you're wrong. And it shut her up on the spot. But this is, again, she didn't, wasn't born that way. When we were kids, uh, she would say, if I was wrong, she'd say, no, that's wrong. This is the way it is. And we might have an argument in the back and forth about it. Okay. And um, we might end up in a situation where neither one of us has enough evidence or proof to uh, back our position, so we just have to let things kind of go. Or uh, one of us would end up saying, you know what, you're right, I'm wrong, okay, and do it that way. Now, the left has so dominated our culture, people are afraid to tell you that you're wrong. So, um, you know, uh, when you're involved in this conversation, call them on it. Just call uh, whoever it is when they say, well, I thought it went like this, you, uh, one of the ways you can do is say, no, you're wrong. Another one way to do it is, of course, to ask the question. Is to, to ask them, so what you're telling me is that I'm wrong. And, and again, it's another good way to uh, jam them up. And they're going to come up with uh, something like, no, 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 that's not what I'm saying. Well, then what are you saying? Okay. And the, the whole idea, again, steer the conversation into a in a binary direction and watch these people. They should be the ones that are scared, by the way. Conservatives are so scared they don't even want to go out in public and admit that they're conservative. Why? What, what is it that we have to be ashamed of? What does a true conservative have to be ashamed of? That they're realistic? That they're patriotic? That they like to make sense? That they like integrity and credibility? No. So um, the whole idea... Get, you want to be able to walk out of the house confident that you can handle whatever it is that the left is going to throw at you. I'm going to hold my head high. I am a true conservative. And I've said it over 800 times in this podcast. I have 830 episodes. And so I've said eight, over 830 times I'm a true conservative and the only one in the United States today. So, um, and every conservative should be able to do that. 
come out and say, yeah, I'm a true conservative. Is that a problem? Okay. Uh, there's no reason for me to hide. The left should be hiding. The left should be afraid. They're, the, every day they get up, they defy reality from dusk to dawn. The only way, reason they get away with it is that true conservatives or not so true conservatives let them get away with it. I'm listening to uh, Hugh Hewitt, and he's, he has this guy on there talking about the, the virus and whatnot, and I thought, I don't know, his voice sounds a little bit uh, familiar. I was thinking that he was uh, sounded a little bit like a local doctor. There's a couple of local doctors they use in California for on KFI and, and other uh, radio stations when they want to talk about the virus. And come to find out, it's Fauci. The F- Fauci is on Hugh Hewitt's show. I'm thinking, and I sent him a tweet. I said to, to Hugh Hewitt, does this guy have any credibility? And then I sent him another tweet because I thought, well, he's going to be there for one segment, 15 minutes. So I'll just tune out for 15 minutes and then come back and we'll move on. No, he's there for another segment. So I sent him a uh, Hugh Hewitt another tweet along. And I remind people to do this. If you're ever going to be doing uh, sending tweets to broadcasters, send it to as many of their sponsors as well. Okay, you want their, because that's the key. That's where the rubber hits the road. Okay, you want the sponsors to know what you're saying. So, uh, anyway, so you've got, um, I said to him and his sponsors, and I said, hey, I'm not going to be listening to your show as long as Fauci's on it. Okay, and by extension, I'm not going to be listening to your um, advertisers either. So, uh, because Fauci, again, has no credit. But anyways, this is one of the things I can do, and it's one of the things any conservative can do. And um, by the way, I wanted to remind uh, people in the audience, this is not a show that's for uh, liberals or for socialists or anybody on the left. If you want to hear somebody, uh, a conservative, not even a conservative, but you want to, want to hear something that might be nice uh, for the left or to the left, go listen to Sean Hannity. He's as neutral as you get. Okay. So uh, go find somebody that's neutral, okay? Maybe, maybe they've got something to say to you. I have nothing to say to the left in, on this program. This is strictly for people that consider this, themselves uh, conservative. So um, the true conservative wouldn't have Fauci on his show. Uh, again, he has no credibility. He's lied and admitted to lying to the American people, and he hasn't done anything to... Um, make amends for that lie. So uh, he's an unrepentant liar. And so he would have no place on a true conservative's show. But then again, Hugh Hewitt is not a true conservative. He calls himself center-right. He calls himself, uh, sometimes he calls himself a center-right conservative. Um, and um, I, I, whatever other words that he uses for neutral, meaning zero. It's like uh, Sean Hannity has a tendency to be zero as well. Sean Hannity comes out and says, uh, well, I'll never call for the boycott of of any, you're a zero. You're a zero. That's all you are. You're a zero. You have lots of potential. You have, uh, I would imagine, tens of millions of people in your audience and you do nothing with them. That makes you a zero. You can't mobilize your audience then you're a zero. You have no power, zero power, and you're really not worth listening to. So uh, I'll listen. The only reason I listen to Sean Hannity is to see if anybody he has anybody interesting as a guest. Um, uh, Newt Gingrich, uh, who's got a lot of credibility problems and integrity problems, but he's got a good voice. He's very intelligent. He's got uh, a tremendous insight uh, and so uh, he's worth listening to if he's on Sean Hannity's show. But other than that, I'm not uh, not a big Sean Hannity fan. And, she, and Sean Hannity isn't a conservative, although he claims he is a member of something called the Conservative Party. Uh, but most of the time he positions himself, and you listen to him, as neutral. He gives you the facts and lets you decide. And uh, the funny thing about it is that uh, in the book uh, by... 
Dr. Lakoff about framing. It's called Don't Think of an Elephant. Uh, he talks about that, about where the left goes wrong is by assuming that if they just give people the facts, that everything will fa automatically fall into place. The right does makes that mistake as well. Just giving people the facts and then assuming that uh, all these tremendous big things are going to start happening is stupid and wrong. Think about the news. That's All this giving the facts thing is supposed to give the the speaker a certain credibility, like the news, except the problem is the news has no credibility anymore. Uh, what gave the, the news credibility was being non-profit, but uh, that's where they get this whole idea of give them the news and then let you decide, and then I'll give you this these certain facts here, and then you're going to go ahead and get upset and start mobilizing and voting in ever-increasing numbers and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all, the, all these magical things are supposed to start happening. It doesn't work that way. If you want people to be mobilized in a particular direction, uh, then you have to uh, assume leadership role and mobilize them in that particular direction. Uh, get your audience uh, uh, pointed in a particular direction. Ask them to do things. Tell them to do things, uh, etc. Don't be a zero. Don't be neutral. You've got to choose. There's no middle ground. There's no easier, softer way. Either if you're not going to act like a conservative, you're not going to come out and proclaim yourself to be conservative, a true conservative, then you're a lefty. That's all there is to it. Okay. There's nowhere to hide. You know, uh, you're a conservative or you're a socialist. Now, and I say socialist, not progressive. There's no such thing. It doesn't exist. It's a fiction. So you're either a conservative or you're a socialist, one of the two. And if you're not going to act like a conservative, if you're not going to promote conservatism, you're not going to say to people that I'm, uh, I'm a conservative, I'm a true conservative, then you're a socialist, period. So um, I'm going to read the uh, chapter 8 of the book called, by Russell Kirk called The Concise Guide to a Conservatism. Conservatives and private property. Perhaps no facile political slogan has done more mischief in our times than the pretense that there is a conflict between human rights and property rights, a notion popularized in this country by Franklin Roosevelt. No principle in English and American politics is better established than respect for the rights of holding and acquiring private property. So the rights of property are ancient and essential human rights. Property is theft, said the anarchist Proudhon. No serious student of society, however, would agree with him, and for that matter, scarcely any 20th century radicals maintained that property as such is baneful. Private property has not been an evil that afflicts sophisticated peoples. On the contrary, it has been a great good. The institution of private property is rooted in inequality, but men, though equally morally, are unequal in every other respect, and to attempt to make them equal by destroying private ownership would only injure the stronger and more energetic natures among men and women without helping the weaker and less provident natures. Private property, properly understood and properly employed, is not the cause of gross materialism in society. Let's see here. One of the uh, principled arguments of the modern collectivist has been that if mankind would abolish private property, it would abolish oppression, inequality, and injustice. In a free society, that, that property is controlled that property is controlled by a multitude of individuals, not one of whom is powerful enough to inflict his will up, upon, the, uh, upon his fellows. Now, if the conservative does not hesitate to assert the positive rights of prop private property, neither is he slow to acknowledge that property has its responsibilities. Yes, property has its duties. In the Christian view, property is bestowed upon particular persons 
persons that they may serve God and their fellow man by putting property to good use. And that was uh, chapter 8 of uh, Russell Kirk's book called The uh, Concise Guide to Conservatism. And what I really did there was I didn't read the entire chapter. I read the topic sentence of each paragraph in the book. And that's something that I would suggest if you're short on time, which very many of us are, and you want to read a book. This was a book of 200 and some odd pages, and you want to be able to get through it fairly quickly. One of the best ways you can do it is by uh, going through and reading the topic sentence of every paragraph in each chapter, and you breeze through the book. You get the essence of what uh, the book is about, and uh, you, but uh, again, you can get through it rather quickly because there's a lot of, of good books out there to read uh, to uh, guide you to be a true uh, conservative. And uh, that brings me to the conclusion of another episode of The Drill. And until next time, be honest, be smart, be beautiful. I'm Ron, and that's The Drill.